the talk is on the, the advent of divine justice. And before we go into the talk, I'd like to ask Dr. Munro, as board member for Northern Ireland, to come up and give us a few words. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You've come here to hear a speaker, Mr. Fananapazir. So I will be as brief as possible because we're all looking forward very much to hearing and sharing what he has to say. But I'm speaking on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Khosravi. I'm speaking for the auxiliary board members who cover Northern Ireland. And I'd like to read a letter to you because we have decided recently that we would like the friends to consider studying a certain book, and this is relevant to this session, in fact. I'll read the letter which we are sending uh, to each of the assemblies and groups uh, and isolated believers in Northern Ireland. Now, if you are an assembly or you are a member of an assembly, please see me afterwards and get your copy of this letter for your group or, or, or assembly. It's addressed from the Auxiliary Board Members for Northern Ireland. It's dated August 1985. It's addressed to the Friends in Northern Ireland. Dearest Baha'i Friends, following a consultative meeting between the councillor living in Ireland, Adib Taharzadi, and the three Auxiliary Board Members, it was decided that we would ask the Friends to make a systematic study of a very important and long message from the Guardian to the American Baha'is, the advent of divine justice. Of all the vital communications that poured from the pen of Shoghi Effendi, perhaps this one, more than any other, relates to the life of the individual Baha'i. The advent of divine justice was written in 1938 and in it the beloved guardian sets forth the spiritual prerequisites for success in every activity for the advancement of the faith. Special emphasis was placed not only upon the imponderable factors associated with the inner life of the spirit but also upon the human and social relationships which must be cultivated and made an integral part of daily life of every Baha'i. We therefore ask every assembly and group to make available copies of this most valuable book to all believers and that a systematic study be arranged over the next months. Both auxiliary board members and their assistants offer their services to the community on this matter and will try and answer any question which may arise during this study. Please feel free to write to the members of the board or invite them to attend a discussion or deepening on any aspect of the book. From time to time we may contact you to see how you're getting on. All of us pray that this exercise of looking more deeply at one of the most enlightening books by the Guardian will help us all with our work building up to the end of this plan and also the launching of the Year of Peace by the United Nations. This will be a year when the Universal House of Justice will address the peoples of the world for the first time since its inception in 1963. This is very exciting to think that a letter is addressed to every human soul on the surface of the earth. In his service, Beman and Keith. Thank you. Before Dr. Fanana Pazir comes forward to give his talk, I'd just like to say a few things about him so that you'll be familiar with his background. He left, he left Iran to pioneer to Africa in 1957, shortly after the start of the 10-year plan. In 1966, he came to the British Isles. He studied at Oxford, and he became a medical doctor. At present, he lives in Edinburgh. He's a very active Baha'i, and he's also very interested in the writings in Arabic and Persian. He has been involved in translations at the World Centre recently. 
So I'd like to call for Dr. Kaze Fernando Fazir, please. I must express my gratitude to the Committee of Northern Ireland Teaching Conference uh, and to the, to the Summer School for inviting me. I was very, very happy that in our community we have Paul Smart. Paul always talks about Northern Ireland and encourages the friends to visit here. And then when Hu Shang Jamshidi wrote and reminded me of the deep love that I felt and was attracted to Northern Ireland, the whole thing just started. He wrote three letters. And then I phoned Keith Monroe's home, and then the whole thing, my love affair again got started again, about coming here and reminding me of all the stories. I'm very, very grateful, and I have learned a lot in the last few days. And the spirit that the Universal House of Justice refer to in their cable is certainly here, this wonderful energy that is going to come to the summer school and from here go and be diffused abroad. This is really what we're going to talk about, the advent of divine justice, communication from the beloved guardian in December the 25th, 1938, is the most wonderful book. And it is about creating this new spirit and the new life in the Baha'i world. Now, I, when I want to talk about a book like that, it's almost impossible to, within the space of time to give you the impression that a study of it or even preparing to talk about it makes on you. On you. I think one of the things, the impressions I have of myself, is that at two o'clock in the morning, one of these nights, and I was staying up to make notes on it, I said, well, you know, I don't know why, why are we saying anything else? It's all been said here, you know, this sort of feeling. And I told my brother, I, I don't know why I'm living, I don't know why I'm breathing, I don't know why everything seems to be here. Because it is such a complete, such a full, divine guidance to the community and to the individual. What happened, though, the historical background of it, to quickly summarize for you, is as follows. In 1938, the assemblies were being formed in the world. The guardianship was already into its 17th year. The, there were Baha'is all over the world by then, just beginning to you know, expand in every direction. But they were still going to engage in what was going to be the first major teaching plan, which is the seven-year teaching plan. Now, the beloved guardian, when the first year of the teaching plan had started, he wrote to them this message and said, now that you are engaged in the seven-year plan, you need some, what are called, essential prerequisites. Without them, you're not going to be successful. Now, in the beginning of this book, the beloved guardian encouraged them very much and said, you've done wonderful things. And the, from the beginning of the history of the faith, the faith that was originated in Iran in 1844 and taken to the West and established by Abdul Baha. At that time, the Americans had already done many things. And this is why the outside of this book has got the temple. Because at that time, they were nearly completing the final contract for the building being completed. And of course, the Second World War started, and by 1953 it was dedicated. So the first paragraph of this book says, I'm very happy that you are making a great effort towards completing the building of the Mother Temple of the West. And the Guardian says in the next sentence, I'm also very glad to receive the reports of your teaching committee. Fascinating. When you look at the book, this is very interesting. He's talking about the building being completed and the reports of your teaching. And the rest of the book is dedicated towards changing the individual to become a very effective teacher. I started to count the number of times the word teacher occurs, teaching in the book. You know, every page you come across five, and I said, look, what's the point of me counting? But again, I become a bit like these people who count words and, you know, let me just get the spirit of it. But I started, I thought, I'll count the first page. It occurs three times, the second page, two. So I said, oh, maybe, what, if, what if I say it's 155, 160? That's not the important thing. But the impression that you get from the book is that the beloved guardian is transforming the Baha'i world. 
And by the way, of course, it was soon translated, although the Guardian wrote in English, into Persian. So it's transforming the whole world. And they found all the writings. He's transforming them for this new day. The word transforming occurs in this book also many times. And I want to share this in the beginning of this talk with you. Now that we have so many years have passed since this book has been written, we have, of course, the Universal House of Justice. The beloved Guardian passed in the 4th of November 1957, when we were in Gambia. You referred to that. Um, and then from then on, of course, the period of the, the hands of the cause, and then the House of Justice. The House of Justice, in 1964, they gave a message. They said, Dearly loved friends, this is the theme we must pursue in our efforts to deepen the cause. Now, I link up with this. Deepen in the cause, what is Baha'u'llah's purpose for the human race? What ends did he submit to for the appalling cruelties? What does he mean by the new race of men? What are the profound changes he will bring about? The answers are in the writings. Go and read them. So four questions. You have all become familiar by these four questions. I think every, people refer to these four questions. But this book, The Advent of Divine Justice, says summer schools are for this purpose. To get a deepening knowledge of the faith and to make... This is, summer schools are... This is, we are in a summer school. You want to go home? You want to say, what are you doing? A summer school. In this book, Advent of Divine Justice, you find everything is defined, not just Baha'i life, even the function of a summer school. So any summer school that you go, whether it's in Ireland or the rest of the world, to the end of your life, you have the mandate written here, highlighted by myself, because I was... What is... It should be a summer school, a powerful center of Baha'i learning, comma, and on the other hand, learning, on the other hand, provide, please note this, because this is the essence of, this is what they call the constitution of summer schools. In the future, they'll have a summer school, and they say, what are we doing in the summer school? They become profound, powerful centers of learning, learning, and on the other, a fertile recruiting ground for the enrichment and consolidation of the teaching force. You see? So really... This is what we, are, we learn from this book. The function also of the summer schools. It should be a powerful center for learning and a fertile recruiting ground for teaching. And we come, of course, to the prerequisites of the teaching. When you get to the question about learning, I linked it up with this message from the House of Justice. It says, what is the purpose of deepening? It is to know what is the purpose of Baha'u'llah's purpose for the human race. Now, in the world order of Baha'u'llah, the Guardian quotes a passage from Baha'u'llah, the Kitab al-Iqan, and it says there, the purpose of any revelation is to transform the individual inwardly and outwardly. And it goes on like this. For if the transformation does not occur in the individual, the futility of God's manifestation is apparent. It's a very, very mighty statement. I'll read the original because it is with me in the second. These words, you are happy because I have said everything that is really to do with this advent of divine justice. It is quoted again in the advent of divine justice. In the world order of Baha'u'llah, I've got the page reference, page 25. The transformation, the new earth, the new heaven, which is in the individual. The heaven and the earth is being changed by bulldozers. We're not talking about that. The transformation of the human heart affected by every revelation in the thoughts and manners of the people is not, question, is not the object of every revelation. Every revelation. Religion. You see, from this sentence we learn, Baha'u'llah is telling us, what's the purpose of any religion? If my great-great-grandfather was a Muslim, or my great-great-grandfather was a Christian. What was the purpose of him being that religion? Or a Jew? Or a Hindu? Or no religion? The purpose, Baha'u'llah says, of every revelation has been to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind. A transformation that shall manifest itself outwardly and inwardly, that shall affect both the inner life and the external con con conditions. For if... The character, if the character of mankind is not changed, 
if Khazir's character is not changed by signing a declaration card, the futility of God's man, universal manifestation comes back. This is a very, very alarming and wonderful and dramatic thing. This is why I think, you know, Betty mentioned about two months. It may happen in a minute. At the end of the seven valleys, Baha'u'llah says, these seven valleys, you can go to it in one moment. This is what we are talking about, the moment of the change. First valley, second valley, third. But then at the end of it, Baha'u'llah says, these seven valleys can be trans gone through, through that moment you turn to the manifestation, the change that occurs. For if the transformation does not occur, now in this advent of divine justice, the guardian says, okay, you know, you are engaged in teaching, you are engaged in the seven year plan, the seven year plan will end in 1944, which is a hundred years since the declaration of the Bab. but you are engaged in this essential prerequisites. Now, the guardian was very, very aware, you know, the divine knowledge that he had. He said, I know that you, the Americans, and really it includes all of us, we says you are still ignorant of the beliefs, the concepts of the peoples and the races from which this faith came. In other words, we are in a different world, but you are moved by the same spirit. In other words, the Baha'i learning starts first from the heart. And the essential change has to happen in the individual. Then he says, if you undergo this period of change in the individual, your vision will expand and expand and expand all the time. So in the very beginning of this book, the message is about a changing vision. Seven-year plan, what is it? It finished in 1944. After that, ten-year plan, it's finished in 1966. What the Guardian says, he says, the opening of the second century, we are now in 142, the second century opens up great vista. Vista means, you know, you just look out new visions in the future. Witnessing the further stages, all of these stepping stones, stepping stones to crusades of greater magnitude. So really, one plan ending, another plan. This is just the beginning of what is in fact called stepping stones, this is page 10 of this, crusades of greater magnitude, all the time becoming greater and greater, and we must fulfill our duties and responsibilities to the author of the whole process, Abdul Baha, Abdullah. We must fulfill our purpose. Then he says here, this is all in the beginning of the book, very beginning, so you get the vision. He says, this vision, this mission that you have, is of a dazzling splendor. But he says, I don't want to tell you everything about it. All I'm going to say, and I've underlined this again here many times, suffice it to say, suffice it, you know, it's sufficient for you to know, that it is premature at the moment to attempt to give an accurate delineation. Some Baha'is, you know, talk to me about the year 2000. You know. He says here, it is not accurately, we cannot delineate accurately, but... He says here, what will happen in this century, which we are now 142? Circumstances unpredictable will be created. Circumstances will be created. Opportunities will be born. So really, we are now living, according to this book, Advent of Divine Justice. Forgive me, I sometimes hold it like this. But anyway, I just wanted to use my sort of workbook for this talk. In this book, we are told that... We are living in an age in which opportunities are being created all the time and conditions are being created. Opportunities are being born, conditions are being created. We then, he says, must be impelled, if we're going to be victorious prosecutors of the plan, to add our part, fresh laurels, to the crown of servitude in the threshold of Baha'u'llah. So the book really is about this. I mean, you know, uh, there will be, in 500,000 years, the Baha'i cycle, everybody will come and read this book, and they can write millions. I mean, you know, I can't imagine how much more knowledge will be added on every word in this. But from my limited vision, the beginning of this book is very, very exciting, because he's saying to them, in this century, I'm not precisely delineating what happens 
Today is the 14th of August, 16th. And I'm not precisely delineating what happens to, you know, tomorrow, but I am confident because of my belief in these words that opportunities are being created all the time. Circumstances are being born. You see, who knew at that time that there will be a revolution in Iran, there will be martyrs? Who knows anything at any day? But we must be sure that opportunities are here all the time, being created, dear friends, and being born. So in 1938, 25th of December, before the Second World War, before Poland being bombed, before the Hiroshima, before, he's telling them, opportunities are being born, and don't sit there, get involved, and add a fresh laurel of servitude. Martha Root, Trevor Finch, that most moving talk yesterday, you know, she received this within a year, less than a year, 25th of December she died, in Honolulu, 25th of December, 1938. Within nine months, she had still been working, received this book, more travel teaching, more work. They, but to the last minute, they added fresh laurels to Baha'u'llah, to the crown itself. Now, so really, that, these, this is the way I've gone with this book. I have tried to, for you and for myself, to crystallize the essence of each paragraph. The essence of the first paragraph was that he's happy the mother temple is being built and there are teaching plans going on. Great. The second paragraph he's mentioning about the birth pangs of the new order and the death pangs of the old order. You've all heard of this. So, but he says the rumblings of catastrophes in the future. Rumblings. You know, the Second World War had not come yet. But he's mentioning that it's rumbling. And now the rumbling is getting louder and louder. I mean, I, I know about peace. I love peace. But you know, the rumblings, you know, because I'm you know, a doctor also, you just you can't even, when you stitch one wound, you're very worried about you know, what's going to happen. It's going to be infected. But still, the rumblings of these upheavals are written by this Anirimpa, the rumblings. But ours is to rise to the opportunities and so on. Now, the other thing that occurred to me when I was looking at this book is this word that occurs many times, dear friends. Unquenchable enthusiasm. Unquenchable enthusiasm. Whenever I think of myself, you know, as an individual, very quenchable. You know, there's a prayer in Persian, Paj Mordein, Paj Mordein. In Persian means we are withered. You know, I, my, you know, there's a very wonderful prayer. It's also in the English prayer. I was as dead, thou didst awaken me. I was, um, I was withered, thou refreshed me. It's a lovely part. Most of the English people will know this by heart. And I also remember this in the... Mordebudam means I was dead. The other one is... I was withered. So he is talking here about... Unquenchable. This... This person who is withering away all the time should all the time become alive again. You know? Unquenchable. He's not going to be packed. He's not going to go back. Individually we feel, huh? you know, Pajmurdi. Unquenchable enthusiasm. Unquenchable enthusiasm. Unquenchable. You know? 4th of November, 1957, is not quenched. When you go to London, you know, Arnos Grove, this is not quenched. When you see that memorial, when you stand before that holy spot, when he says, unquench, it's not quenched. It's not quenched as far as he's concerned. You see? So realize, you realize this is about irresistible. How many times in this book I come across this word? Irresistible. Mughavamat na pazir. This wonderful man, Mavadat, translated this, and he's died as well. In my, uh, wonderful. He's a beautiful Persian translation. Muqavamat na pazir. This faith, you can't kill every behind. We know it's irresistible. 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 Unquenchable. Un repeating. This is an incredible thing. So this book is about this. Systematic study means, ladies and gentlemen, that we should really look at these, uh, these words. And now there's another thing that I had in the beginning of this, which I had... He talked about, I had memorized it in my mind, it was like something like ACT, A-C-T. Audacity, consecration, tenacity, undying enthusiasm. I find the page. But I remember this morning about ACT, S -S -S ACT. Audacity. He said the requisites of teaching are audacity, consecration, 
tenacity. You see, my memory is like, you know, you know, I have to think of how to remember. You can't, audacity, consecration, tenacity, holding to it, and then uh, unquenchable enthusiasm, S-U-D. He says, these are the pre essentials Now, the next thing, of course, is something which, you know, anybody can think, you know, why am I getting this letter? you know, in the United States when they got this. Why is it something, you know, anybody, you know, why are we reading this in English? You know, why are we, you know... He is, first of all, the, dispends this page and this page. And the next page. Three pages. Yeah? Taking the veil off. He's telling them straight. God gives a duty to somebody to do something. Not because of any inherent virtue, any inherent grace, any remarkable capacity. He mentions this so many times here that it is not because of any superiority, political capacity, spiritual virtue. You see, some people may think, oh, maybe because, you know, in America they have a constitution about equality of, you know, man, right? You know, maybe because, you know, they are the democracy. May no, no, no. The guardian says, let me write it down clearly. It's not because of any superiority, political capacity, spiritual... Fact. No! It is because of its crying needs. Oh, that's... So anybody who gets this message, it's because we, when uh, Keith and bless them and the other guys who, you know, who thought about studying this, it's because they probably think we also need... I mean, anyone who starts... Because of their crying needs. They're lamentable degeneracy. I mean, that's really pretty strong if you call something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lamentably degenerate. Well, irremediable perversity. I mean, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> no, he's mentioning this, not especially about the recipients of this, but he's mentioning the manifestations of God, Baha'u'llah, the Baab, Muhammad, Jesus Christ. They always appear, he says, in a country where they are crying in need. Lamentably degenerate, because I'm Iran, Iran and I can say this, you know, with great. Lamentably degenerate, irremediable perversity. The prophets of God choose to appear in these environments, and then what happens? That word I told you, please don't forget that word. Transforming what is really lamentable, irremediable, <laughs> turning them. From the depths of misery oh, to, <laughs> to give this grace. So they become levers. You know, lever, I, I don't know, an engineer, I don't, but I think lever is something that you want to lift something. You know, you have a lever. You know, lever. Anyway, I, I had an issue. Hmm? Ahrom, in Persian. Ahrom. You see, you, need a, you want to lift a book up, you need a lever. So he says. Manifest Jack, manifestations of God come, for example, Baha'u'llah and the Bab appeared in Iran, using these people who are lamentably degenerate, this, 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 I don't want to repeat my insults about myself. But, <laughs> but he uses them, eh, and uses this as a lever to transform. He mentions this, of course, about Christ, about Muhammad, about all the prophets, of course, about Baha'u'llah. He mentions this so you feel really, you know, when you read this message as an Iranian, you feel, God, I'm so, thank God. <laughs> but then, you see, the American people, of course, we are not like them. I mean, you know, we are not lamentably degenerate. We are not. He says, to a lesser degree. Huh? To a lesser degree. Ah, this is, there's only one American here, Sandy and Tracy. But, I mean, you know, but anyway, to a lesser degree. <laughs> to a less... <laughs> a Scottish, okay. A Scottish. Anyway, believe me, it applies. It says, to a lesser degree... To a lesser degree, this applies. Hey, Bonnie, do you know, to a lesser degree, this applies to those who are going to receive this. To a lesser degree, you know. Thank God, you know. They are, so they, <laughs> but still, the same principle. To a lesser degree, they should they are, because of the things. And he mentions this. I mean, I think this word I have also studied in this book. It is called excessive. It is called binding. It is called brutal. What is it? Somebody, some of the bright guys. You know. Huh? He knows, he knows, he's, you know, you should. The word is material. It's called in this book brutal. It's called in this book excessive. It's called in this book 
binding. It's called in this book enervating. Therefore, you see, enervating. It's very interesting. I mean, I, these words you think about them. Why they call enervating? You know, when we have a frog in experiments in medicine, you know, you cut the nerve. You have the leg there. The leg is not moving. We call this denervating because you cut the nerve. But he uses the word innervating, which means the nerve is completely going. Take nerve, feeling, sensation, you know. Enervating. Brutal. No, this is another word. I mean, enervating and brutal. Brutal is brute. You know, it's, it's, I mean, you know. Is it brutal or is it brutalize you? I mean, there are some scholars here, Trevor and Roger Prentice, and they all think about these in so many different ways. But let's think about it. Brutal material. Is it brutal or is it brutalize you? Is the tank brutal or the one who makes the tank or thinks of a better tank? I mean, you know, <laughs> what happens? Or the one who sells the tank? Or you see, you become, wow, or you become, wow, the Guardian. In 1938, before the tanks are rolling into Poland, he's threatening them. Brutal materialism. While the physicists are building the atomic bomb, he was writing to them. Brutal materialism. Brutalizes you. Brutalizes you. Enervating. Enervating means you don't feel. You know, a small prick, you feel it. It takes away the feeling. How can we read the story of the martyrs of Iran and not be moved to redouble our efforts? Enervating. You know, the nerve gets... Or any other, of course, of the wars and all the things that happen in the various parts. Now, just to end on a happy note, having defined this tremendous thing that is the transforming, he mentions a good thing. If, in the garden is very just. The book is called Divine Justice. In this book, you always find a sense of goodness. He says, having mentioned this materialism and all this, I must not... There are other things that are good. You see? You see, they always see the good. Of all the irremediable... He says there are something good about the Western world. It's intelligence. It's youthfulness. It's energy. Enterprise. You see, Sandy's talk. This enterprise. They have enterprise. We have to learn. You know, coming from that background. Enterprise. A new idea. Enterprise. Intelligence. Unbounded initiative. You see. So he's mentioning those. But he says these qualities that they have, you know, Baha'is are non-Baha'is, they have that. These qualities too should be used for the greater plan, which is of course the teaching. Now, in the very beginning of this book, you know, we should focus. The word focus is, you know, you concentrate. But he uses the word focus himself. The whole book we should focus. Because Abdul Baha, as you know, this is every Baha'i knows, writing the will and testament, he is the sign of God. Infallible guide, Ayatollah, he that has listened to him has listened to God, man khalafa, who he has opposed him, has opposed the will of God, and all these things, you know, so divine institution. But still, he himself sometimes focuses on something extra. Now, what does it mean? It means that you and I, all of us, should focus ten times more. I mean, you know, if you imagine yourself, you are in the presence of the guardian, you focus on everything. If you go to the you know, to the shrine of the garden, this holy spot in London, you're praying there for Ireland and teaching and for yourself and for your family, you're thinking, you're focusing on everything. But, when he himself says, you must also focus on something more, you have to really then ask God to focus on that doubly. I mean, I can't use the... But I feel that this is what he's trying to transmit. He says, now, you focus on everything from the beginning. Well, the very first word... To the beloved of God. You focus to the beloved, you know, of course. But in the middle, he says, now you must focus your attention. On what? On the self. Its needs, its deficiencies, its weaknesses. And then intensify the effort to change the self. Eradicate it. Not only in yourself, your community, but even the world outside. And this links up, ladies and gentlemen, with the message to the youth, which has been read by Betty and by everybody about how the Baha'is, the young people who go up and up in all the... And Paul referred to this, and Alan referred... When they become excellent, they can trans-change the professions, everybody else. Here it is written. Everything coming from these sources of authority, they're all linked up, very clearly, unmistakably. He says, once they learn their deficiencies, they change them, they then become equipped, equipped, you know, armed, to change 
their countrymen, the entire body of their fellow citizens in the world. So he mentions these focusing. And then, I, you know, the summary, everybody knows this because it's at the back of it. The summary of these three things which he asks them to draw their attention to is recent. He mentions these things. He says, I have surveyed. Now, you see, it's very interesting. Very interesting. For me, it was the most exciting. You see, because when you listen to communities, they say, you know, in, in America today, they write letters to the journal. In my view, we should do this. In my view, I have studied the situation in Texas, and I think we should do this. In my view, in Sacramento, I think we should do this. I think we need, in, you know, in the area of Scotland, this particular effort. In the area of, uh, I think, England, we have this special problem here. In the area of, no, dear friends, he says, I have surveyed the needs of the world. It's something, you know. You know, when you read the first word in the paragraph, Serving as a whole, believe me, believe me, as Mr. Khadim used to be, when you realize you're in the presence of somebody, some reality, sign of God in Palestine, shrine of Baha'u'llah and the Bab from two branches, he's writing here, I have surveyed what you need. Most pressing needs. Oh, the Lord. <laughs> Trevor is laughing because this is an exclamation, Allah, how we say sometimes when you, you can almost say golly, almost Allah. It's almost genetic. In the, you know, he has surveyed the most pressing needs of the community, the most serious deficiencies. And what are they? Well, you all know what they are, and you're all trying to write them, but this is, for the few minutes that I have, we must just mention a few things about them and really dedicate the summer school, all summer schools, to the deepening and to making them effective teaching instruments based on these concepts. And indeed all the other activities. These requirements, again, are none other. He's most pressing, and then he says they're none other. High sense of moral rectitude. High sense of moral rectitude. I don't need to read it. It should be written here. It shouldn't be written here. It should be part of the neurons. You know, I mean, this is why I think I've not done my duty as far as this goes. These things are none other. Moral rectitude. Chastity freedom from prejudice. And then the rest of these is dedicated to the meaning of these, the significance of this, the, and how this is going to really be thought about, and contemplated, up to here. You can say up to the rest, but in terms of words, major part. Rectitude. Freedom from prejudice. The third one. Chastity. And really, you know, this book is going to be in every shelf, in every bedroom, the high bedroom, you know, tonight, tomorrow. It should be. I mean, if it's not, I feel I have not done my duty. Um, you know, really, I mean. Sorry? Exactly. Well done. I love it. It should be on the neurons. It should be part of it. Exactly. It should be, it should be really, it should be sort of the daydreams and the night dreams. So, when you got this, you see, you're very nice put point. Put um, when you get this, and it is in your part of you've assimilated it. You realize you yourself can go over it. So in other words, Khazef Hanan has no authority to expound. You know, he's only read. But what is sometimes interesting is that somebody reads it, he comes across a point, he hits it, and then he mentions to another point. So some of the things that have hit me, I'll share it with you. And they are all at random, but it just shows how this book is an incredible advance you know, teaching-wise, in education-wise. I mention this to some people because I'm suddenly jumping to the second one for a point of interest. The second of these, he says, is, of course, chastity. Chastity. Now, you know, I was brought up in a Catholic school in Africa. In 1957, when we went to Africa, Gambia, in April, for six years I had Irish teachers from County Mayo, you know, for my, for my uh, happiness and my eternal joy and <laughs> gratitude. <laughs> You know, I had the usual things, you know, bending down, you know, you know the, on Thursdays I didn't go to confession, but all the beating on the hands. <laughs> I went, you know, all of the Irish fathers, you know, it's amazing. Six years, they are, you know, they made me. I mean, you know, because up to the age of 12, everything, uh, they say that you're made up to the age of three anyway, but anyway, up to the age of 12. So these Irish teachers in Gambia, there was the only school. <laughs> so, was, and of course, the concept of chastity, of course, they talked about chastity as well, and they have it. 
You see, what I realized is interesting. Mankind in the Baha'i faith transforms not only itself, but its concepts. You ask a doctor, PCC a doctor and consultant and this. You ask a priest, chastity means negative. You don't do, don't, 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 don't. What does Shoghi Effendi say in the advent of divine justice? This principle of chastity, I don't want to go to this in very great detail because, you know, this is something an individual should really be in his own. It says, this principle of chastity contributes decisively. So, it's, first of all, instead of thinking negative, it means I'm, I'm chaste, I'm negative, I'm, I'm not doing something which others are doing. No, no, this is a different concept. It contributes chastity. What does it contribute? To the virility. Oh, oh God, this is incredible. Every... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, this is the divine physician. This is, what is he? What is this book? You know? Chastity means, you know, you told from, don't. The principle of chastity. The pre- contributes. You know, I'm not making it up. It's underlined. <laughs> <laughs> to the virility. To the driving force. Oh, Allah. This is so, you, so, so everything, you know, I, I don't want to expound on this point again because of, you know, personal. But if you really think outside world, they say, you know, to do the other, it shows you're manly, you know, you're womanly or whatever. You know. No, 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 no. He's got divine eye. Chastity contributes to the virility. I don't want to look and define virility for you. But anyway, you can look it up. Virility, the purity, the driving force. I use this because, you know, this example, it's just one, it's only one sentence of the whole book. It gives you a tremendous vision. He's talking about something, you know, the Baha'i vision. So it's not any negative, anything. You see, because in the beginning of my training, because when the teaching of Christianity is that from the beginning it was viewed as a negative thing. Thou shalt not look at a woman. St. Matthew's was Greek. Who said not? Not, not, not. And this is a different vision. You look, but what is the vision? This is why I think you should go into it and see. He says here something which uh, my brother used to quote, you know, is, it has no compromise with the theories, the standards, the habits, the excesses of the decade. This is something else. No compromise. This is not a sort of, you know, no, you keep saying no. I mean, this is beautiful English, really. Look, I mean, look at the poetry. Nay. No. I mean, the, the Persian has had a good time translating into Persian. You can imagine, yeah, we're there. He yeah, had a very happy time. I love the translation. The, the, the divine revelation. Pernicious character. Pernicious character. Please delete this last sentence because pernicious character. You know? Pernicious ideas that people had at that time, 1938. Permissiveness. I mean, I have to read now the Newsweek, AIDS, Observer, AIDS, Sunday Times, AIDS. You see, pernicious character. These theories, the hollow, the ideas that they had. You know, Keith knows, when you come to university in 1966, the 60s, 66, 67, 68, 69. You read this at that time, you read it now. You see, thank God I was a Baha'i, at least, you know, I mean, you know, please help me. Not to, but, you know, basically you feel, you know, let me get hold of this book, you know, because... It seemed that at that time he anticipated. I mean, who would have thought, you know, these, this is why I think you should delete this section. But, you know, who would have thought, you know, these things are, you know, Newsweek, six pages, Observer, Sunday Times, hemophilia, everybody's. What can, what, how come this disease? T cells, T cells, you know, as meds, they're infected. What are the origin of it? Is that delete that. I hope that's uh, actually. And, uh, but anyway, so, so really, what he's talking about, so this is the second one. The first one, of course, is rectitude of conduct. I have two nephews. My brother has two boys. And I said to them, by Friday, you know, when I'm in, in Ireland, I hope you'll memorize this sentence. I'm trying to, you know, memory is very useful. Memorize this. I hope they'll memorize it. They have promised that they will. I said, what sentence are we going to memorize? You know, this, Sarah knows them, my brother Karen's children. They memorize this sentence. Sentence from Baha'u'llah about the first requisite. What is this? The purpose of the one true God 
manifesting himself is to summon all mankind to truthfulness, to sincerity, to piety and trustworthiness, to resignation and submissiveness to the will of God, to forbearance, to kindliness, to uprightness, the wisdom. 1967, they say here, deepening means finding the purpose of God. August 1985, the purpose of God, page 20. I don't know. I mean, you find these sentences, you start, the purpose. There are not many of them. I mean, you know, the person who puts all these purpose of God sentences, I think he's going to get a nice book published and he's be very happy. But please don't do it before me. I, I want to read. <laughs> but, you know, this is... Paul and, uh, and Michael are having a smile. But this is a, a few sentences like, the purpose of God, find out the purpose of God is deepening. The purpose of God, we read the previous passage about transformation, and this one is to m- m- summon mankind to truthfulness, to sincerity, to piety, to trustworthiness, to resignation, submission. So suddenly you find, these are the prereqs. These qualities, when they're manifested, we mentioned chastity, we mentioned this, and he develops this. Faithfulness. Uh, let your tongue be ch- let your eyes be chaste, your hand faithful, your tongue truth, your heart enlightened. Be an ornament to the countenance of truth, a crown to the brow of fidelity. The children had to memorize only that sentence, but there are a lot of these. Let truthfulness and courtesy be adorning. Suffer not yourselves to be deprived of the robe of justice. Tremendous vision. That's why, you know, when a Christian, when a Muslim, they want the essence of their faith, they come across these. Yes, this is just not another name. It's really calling people to the same divine verities. This word, verity, verity. There is no, nowhere in the writing of the Guardian, we write, we read the word dogma, doctrine, dogma, verity, verity. It's interesting, it's very interesting. When I was in a Catholic school, Christian dogma, Christian Catholics. Lord, Father of Fathers, Holy of Fathers, and you just learn. It's dogma. No, they're talking about verities. Verities mean something which is really grows, truths, the manifestations of God. And the verities are all in this book, in the beginning of this book, the verities that will transform it. We mentioned about this remarkable thing about virility. He goes on to say, I'm just giving you glimpses of it. A holy life, a life of prayer, is the controlling principle and the behavior and conduct of all Baha'is. Controlling principle. You see, you go now to university, any university, America, Ireland, England, France, what is the controlling principle of human behavior? You study six years of PhD, and so I'm not saying the enlightened ones, but some of them. The controlling principle is self-preservation. Self! Self! I, got it. I was a year in the States. I got it so much, I got frightened. I came back to Scotland. Quick. <laughs> no, this is, again, delete that. Some of it. <laughs> but, you know, you go there and experience it. Just This self, and it exists here as well. Self? No. The controlling principle of the Fendi say is a holy life. Controls in, 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 You see, again, the negative view of holiness is just you going back in your room. No, it's praying to Mecca or praying. No, 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 no. It's, this is in holy life is the controlling principle. It's again a very positive thing. The holy life, the holy conduct, becomes the principle of conduct. You know, you see, there is a principle of conduct in biology. You know, you put your hand in cold water, and you withdraw. It's a reflex. This is biological self-preservation. You burn it to withdraw. This is a reflex. There are two neurons involved. Anyway, this is not medicine. But here, we're talking about holy life. The controlling principle of the Baha'i life, which gets the spirit of man, should be holiness. So that the holy person comes across a bad theory, a bad idea, a hateful... It's true. This is not for me. This is not going to get me nearer to Baha'u'llah. This is not good for me. This is... You see... So it's not a, it's, you know, it's very interesting. I haven't developed this again, but I was just reading this recently. It seems very interesting. Controlling principle. This is what something that uh, Sandy, our dear Sandy mentioned this morning. You know, the, even looking for appointments, looking for job. The whole thing becomes a different concept. In the message to the youth, in May 1985, they say the same thing. They say, 
What do they say? There will be a transformation in the functioning of society. Function. You go, you come with me, we enter our name after a lot of A-levels and a lot of hassle, we go to university. We study sociology, economics, politics. We study any, you know, we might. Okay, you know, it's, it's an income. We study, but at the end of these things when we study, well, they say, well, what is the society functioning at? Is it functioning along Max Weber's principles? Durkheim's? You know, I'm just using some names, please forgive me for names dropping. Is it, <laughs> again, is it again Emile Durkheim? Is it against Monsieur Marx? Is it against Marcuse? Is it this? No. They, their concepts of society, whatever the functioning of society was, after six years and a PhD and a lot of papers and a lot of hard work and a lot of mm, coffees and so on, whatever, <laughs> you, come, you come in May 1985 and the House of Justice says, no, no, no. The society and its functioning, function, whatever Durkheim and Weber and these guys thought about function, will be transformed. Whatever I thought about holiness, transformation, new heaven. As I tried to relate to this. So really, these things which are under, but there are of course some very direct things, you know, because it is really not. Nudism, alcoholic drinks, opium, Habit-forming drugs. You know, these are, these are not capable of interpretation. It's very, very interesting. Easy familiarity. Easy familiarity. Companionate marriage. Infidelity in marital relationships. Promiscuity. Familiarity. Sexual vices. 1938, before AIDS, before anything. All of these, he says, are pernicious, destroying, and the Baha'is show the sacrilegious character of these. Now, this is a very interesting sacrilegious. The Baha'is are not saying, oh yes, I don't think we should do this because, you know, in the general view of the situation. No, no, it's sacrilegious. Sacrilegious. You're breaking a holy principle. Ah. So the controlling principle is holiness. Therefore the vices, the immoralities, the materialism, all the things that he mentions. Again, I don't want to delineate because I don't want to, you know, these are again private study. All one man's life. It's a continual challenge. When you study it in depth, he says, these things are sacrilegious. Sacrilegious. The word sacrilege occurs once in the New Testament. Anybody who should swear against the Holy Spirit, that is not forgiven. You know, it's in Matthew's Gospel. But if you just curse Christ, it can be forgiven and so on. The Holy Spirit. So the cursing of the Holy Spirit is called tajdif. Tajdif al Qudus. It's unforgiven. Sacrilege. Mm. Very sinful. Sacrilegious character of the excesses. So, so in other words, holiness. Anyway, now let's go on to some, this is some. And there are of course other things, you know, the, the, <laughs> but there is a balance in it and I think the balance is, most of the, of course, when I was young I was very keen to see the balance of it coming quickly, you know, somewhere, and of course you find the balance, you know, oh ye people, eat of the good things which God has allowed you, deprive not yourselves of the wondrous beauties, bounties, this is not Puritanism, this is not asceticism, this is not bigotry, you know, all these things. You see, they, you know, very interesting. This is not asceticism, this is not, this is not Edinburgh, this is not, this, this is, delete, this is, this is not, no, Baha'u'llah wants you to legitimate joys, bounties, because this is the way you are going to. This Paul is laughing at Render thanks unto God, you know. Eat he and deprive. Not letting anything to intervene between him and God. Intervene. I mentioned yesterday that the only charge that you find in the writings of the guardian about the priests is that they intervened between man and God. Interposed, intervened, intervened, you know. So if you don't let anyone, whether it's a priest, whether it is your food, whether it's your desire to get a new car, any, anything to intervene between your love for God. So the balance. Anybody. Your knowledge can become an intervention. Your joy, your pride. As long as it's not intervening between your love for God. You're going to Baha'u'llah. Imagining the Baab. This is what the Baab was. This is what Jesus was. Father, they know not what they do. Into thy hand, not my will, but thy will. This Final business. Not my will, but my will. Long obligatory prayer. I went, you know, to, 
to Dumfries, I saw Sarah and the people there, the marvelous, they, they said it by heart. And for the first time, it really hit me, you know, they, they know it by heart in English as well. Every Baha'i experience, and this is in the Baha'i long obligatory prayer. Not my will, but thy will. And nothing intervenes. Then you become an effective teaching instrument. Somebody remind me about the time of everyone. So that really, then we are now up to page 30. We are making it with progress. Um, but this is the essence of some of these passages. They don't intervene. Baha'u'llah says to a lady in Persian, and I think this is, makes the interesting thing when I said about anybody intervening. He says, Ey bagon, O lady, ashaube naur baush, ahle riyama baush. Dar meykhane sakin Go and live in a tavern, she tells the lady. This is very strong, emphatic things, not being translated. Go and live in a tavern. Which is a beer, you know, this. You know, meykhane, wine. But don't enter the road of hypocrisy. Because, you know, don't make your actions. Go and live. Because, you know, if you live it, God knows. Sar bede, give your head. Get smart. Del made. Don't give your heart. Very strong. In Persian, it's so strong. I think that's why some of these are not translated. Sar bede, give your head. It means I do. Del made. Don't give your heart. Zira sanj karaj. Go and underneath the stone. Dar sawye tahtul hanaj. Don't go under the shelter of somebody, you know, you think, you know, because of his position. Actually, Taht al literally means you know, religious leaders, but don't go just, go! Tremendous! This is what he says, Shogu Effendi, his great grandson. No compromise. So this is the spiritual, the road is narrow, the path. Now, an interesting thing, just like a little story, because I think, you know, this book is going to be the subject of many things. Keith is going to educate us on this. We are going to educate ourselves. And this is a beginning, this seven-year plan. We must get to this book, finish it quickly, assimilate it, so that we can get these goals and teach to the end of our... Because the point of the book is this word teaching. Hundreds of times we become effective in school. But this, one of the stories which I will share with you is an interesting thing. It shows the thought. Sheikh Sa'aduddin Hamavi, one of the, Baha'i, one of the pre-Baha'i people who anticipated this faith. Sheikh Sa'aduddin Hamavi. He was with a lot of horses. He was on horseback. He came across a river. I mentioned this to track. He ma- came across a river. The river was pure crystal water. And they have to cross with their horses because I think they were migrating or fleeing ac- to get across the water. The horses are just standing there. They're not going to cross. So the whole journey is stopped. So they ask Sheikh, this great teacher, who anticipated, let's say, the Baha'i faith, what should we do? The horses are not crossing the river. It's, ah, I got the answer. Go and get a lot of mud. Gel. Get, get a lot of mud in the top. Put all the mud in the water. Make the water very muddy. They look at Sheikh. Very strange. Thing. Very strange thing this guy is telling us. You know? Muddy the water. So they muddied all the water. The water became very muddy. The horses <laughs> jumped across. Ah! Sheikh, what happened? Ah, oh, Sheikh told him. When the water was absolutely clear and transparent, in this, the horses looked at themselves. They saw themselves. They can't cross the bridge. Self. Mud. Can't see this. This book, because of my time, is about this. The individual gets the, the self becomes so pure as a result of this principles of this book that it can cross the bridge. And the bridge is the next 50 pages. 